a Gregor Mendel. He is, well, you might know him as the father of modern genetics. And he's gonna talk about uh, his life, his experiments, and his loves. Um, let's welcome him. Hello, my name is Gregor Johan Mendel, and I was born on July 22, 1822. Actually, Rosa Mendel were my parents. They raised me in our family in a farm. And what was the time that happened in Australia? So I sat there until I was 11 years old, thanks to a local schoolmaster who was impressed with my aptitude for learning. He recommended me that I be sent to secondary school in Tropo to continue my education. Even though it was like for a good reason, these changes had my family to experience financial difficulties even if I felt it. Thankfully, in 1840, I graduated from school with honors, of course. After that, I decided to enter a two-year program at the Philosophical Institute of the University of Olmutz, from which I graduated in 1843. That same year, I joined the Augustina Order at the St. Thomas Monastery in Bern, and was given the name Gregor. In 1849, more than five years later, I was sent to fill a temporary teaching position in nine because I was starting to get sick after a lot of work. However, I filled a teaching certification exam the following year. So, in 1851, I was sent to the University of Vienna. There, I studied mathematics and physics under Christian Doppler and studied botany under Franz Unger. In 1853, upon completing my studies at the University of Vienna, I returned to the monastery in Vienna and was given a teaching position at a secondary school, where I stayed for more than a decade. It was during this time that I began the experiments for which I am best known. Around 1854, I had begun to research the transmission of hereditary traits in plant hybrids. At that time, it was accepted that the hereditary traits of the offspring of any species were the little blending of the traits present in the plants. It was also accepted that over generations a hybrid will revert to its original form. They suggested that a hybrid could not create new forms. However, such studies were, were not bad with a reasonable period of time during experimentation, whereas my research continued over many years and involved tens of thousands of individual plants. <sighs> I chose to use peace for my experiments and after analyzing my results, I reached very important conclusions, the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. I also proposed that this heredity follow basic statistical laws. In 1865, I delivered two lectures on my findings to the Natural Science Society in Bern, who published the results of these in their journal the following year, under the title Experiments on Plant Hybrids. I have to confess, I did little to promote my work, People thought that I had shown only what was already known at the time, that hybrids eventually re revert <laughs> to original form. Later, yeah, that's a good joke. Thank you. Later, my fans were not viewed as applicable. And because of this pressure, I don't know what, I suspected too that they only applied to certain species or type of traits. Yeah, now people know my system. It's of general application and it's one of the foundation principles of biology. In 1868, I was elected about other school, where I had been teaching for the previous 14 years. Sadly, my resulting administrative duties and my gradually failing eyesight kept me from continuing an extensive scientific work. Then, I was isolated from my contemporaries as a result of public opposition to an 1874 taxation law that increased the tax on the monasteries to cover church expenses. Finally, I died on January 6, 1884, when I was 61 years old. I was laid to rest in the monastery's burial plot, and my funeral was, of course, well attended. My work, however, was still largely unknown. It was not until decades later when my research informed the work of several non geneticists, botanists, and biologists conducting research on the ready that its significance was more appreciated and my story began to be referred to as Mendel's Law. A team of botanists independently proclaimed my experiments and results in the 1900s. Find out that both the data and the journal theory have been published in 1866 by me. People questioned if the trio of botanists were not aware of my previous results. Fortunately, they soon gave me credits. Even at that time, my work was marginalized by Darwinians who say that my findings were irrelevant to the theory of evolution. As genetic theory continued to be a lot, 
the relevance of my work fell in and out of favor. But my research and theories are considered fundamental to any understanding of the field, and I'm considered the father of modern genetics. Can you now describe each of your experiments with peace? I study inheritance in peas because peas have been used for similar studies, are easy to grow and can be shown each year. Pea flowers contain both male and female parts, called stamen and sigma, and usually self-pollinate. Then I crossed these pure breeding lines of plants and recorded the traits of the hybrid progeny and found that all of the first generation hybrids look like one of the parent plants. For example, all progeny for purple and white flower cloths were purple. And, however, when he allowed the hybrid plants to self-pollinate, the hidden traits will appear in the second generation hybrid plants. Each of the trait variants is a dominant or recessive. Dominant traits, like purple flower color, appear in the F1 hybrids, where recessive traits, like white flower color, did not. I did thousands of cross-breeding experiments. My conclusion was that there was three times as many dominant as recessive traits in F2 plant plants. I also experimented to see what would happen if plants with two or more purebred traits were crossbred, and I found that each trait was inherited independently of the other and produced its own 3-1 ratio. But I didn't stop there. I continued to allow the peas to self-pollinate over several years whilst meticulously recording the characteristics of the progeny. I may have grown around three or maybe 30,000 pea plants over seven years. In 1866, published the paper experiments in plant hybridization. In it, proposed that heredity is a result of each parent passing along one factor for every trait. If the factor is dominant, it will express in the progeny. If the factor is recessive, it will not show up but will continue to be passed along to the next generation. Each factor works independently from the others and they do not blend. So, my statement to this loss is in a cross of parents that appear for contrasting traits, only one form of the trait will appear in the next generation, offspring that are hybrid for a trait without only the dominant trait in the phenotype. But as we all know, I use peas to observe the hereditary effects of different types of breeding. Pure means monohybrid, whereas contrasting tall pea plant. However, when a plant this sits after harvesting, found that all of the offspring plants were tall. So if there exists two contrasting traits, one of the traits will always suppress the other, thereby expressing it. T suppresses T lowercase, both making the offspring tall. Such a trait is known as dominating trait. The suppressed trait is known as recessive trait. Also, this recessive trait freely expresses itself in the absence of the dominant state. So, in the pea plant, the seed color yellow always dominates seed color green. And the principle of segregation describes how pairs of gene variants are separated into reproductive cells. The segregation of gene variants called alleles and their corresponding traits was first observed by me in 1865. I was studying genetics by performing. Uh, made in crosses in blue plants, sorry. When I crossed two heterozygous pea plants, which means that each plant had two different alleles at a particular genetic position. I discovered that the traits in the offspring of its crosses did not always match the traits in the parental plants. This meant that the pair of alleles encoding the traits in each parental plant had separated or segregated from one another during the formation of the reproductive cells. Okay. So, from my data, I formulated the principle of segregation. Afterwards, I discovered the combinations of traits in the offspring of my previous crosses did not always match the combinations of traits in the parental organisms. From my data, I formulated the principle of independent assortment. So, I want to explain how do we use a plant square. So, when given enough info about two parent organisms, we can use this window pane to predict the genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring. So, I'm going to define what a genotype is. The genotype is the genes of an organism. For example, the trait used two letters to represent the genotype. So, for dominant form of the gene, we use the uppercase letters. And for the recessive form of the gene, we use lowercase letters. 
and also modify where it's a phenotype. The phenotype is a physical appearance of a trait in our organism. For example, for the red throat of Bobby Bird, the red throat is dominant trait in white throat in recessive. Since the red throat code and the white throat code are alleles, we abbreviate them with two forms of the same letter. So we use R for the dominant allele trait red throat and R lowercase for the recessive allele trait white throat. Our possible genotypes and phenotypes will be like so. Here are the basic steps to use in quite a square when solving a DNA question. Number one, determine the genotypes of the current organisms. Y down the crows. Three, draw a up square. Split the letters of the genotype for each parent and put them outside the P square. Five, determine the possible genotypes of the offspring by filling in the P square. Six, summer results. Seven, best in the glow of your accomplishment. What did I teach people? Life isn't easy. You may think, if I cross two people, child with brown eyes, thus often a child with brown eyes. But let me tell you, it's not as simple as that. There are laws. Laws. That would define the characteristics of an offspring. Therefore, whether you are tall or short, it's not the result of the grace of our Lord. How did it influence in your work? In 1843, when I was 20 years old, I was in financial difficulties and one of my teachers, Professor Frederick Franz, advised me to join the Abbey of St. Thomas in Bernas and So I decided to join the Abbey to continue studying science while ensuring I could get by financially. And being honest, I was more interested in science than religion. Later, when I joined the Abbey, I took the name Gregor just to have a fresh start. From then on, people call me Gregor Mendel.